Invisible People by Margaret Kiljoy. Originally published in the anthology Accessing the Future. Edited by Catherine Allen and Jabril Al Ayad. For more written by Margaret Kiljoy, go to birdsbeforethestorm.net. And for more anarchist audiobooks and zines, go to resonanceaudiodistro.org. Invisible People The last light of the sun came down through the broken windows, all pretty and shit, catching on that big jagged shard of glass and then pouring out into the room over my bed. Over Marcellus. He snored in that way he always did, endearing and soft. I hurried to dress in the last of the daylight, but once I was done, I lingered. I paced. I ran my fingers through my beard. I watched the twilight horizon and counted the silhouette bones of the buildings Portland calls its skyline. Anything but go to work. It had been a lot easier, stealing from rich people, back before the anxiety had hit. I miss those old days when my biggest problems were external. It's easier to steer clear of cops than it is to get away from whole chunks of my brain. I can't get on the net, either. I mean, I can still get in. The people in the office next door haven't updated their Wi-Fi encryption since 2019. I just can't bring myself to sign on. Not even the dark net. It may not be corporate, but it's still the net. There's just too much data in the feed. Too much shit to worry about. Every day someone's sick. Some friend of a friend's got cancer, or your ex-boyfriend, the one you haven't seen since high school, is in for surgery. Someone you met at a party six months ago got caught doing something and needs bail. The awful shit tragedies of 2,000 quote friends pile up worse than the latest mass shooting or another pandemic scare. And those are bad enough. I can't get on the net. I won't. But I've got to eat. The room went dark and I stumbled my way through the warehouse. Five paces out of the room, I turned the corner. A window let in enough streetlight and there, past the accumulated junk of fifteen squatters, I could see the door at the bottom of the stairs. I pressed my body into the bar and I was outside. The squat's chemical smell was gone, leaving only that sickly shit stink that comes in off the Willamette dampened a bit by the endless winter rain. I pulled out a phone, who still uses handheld phones, and I told it to call Ramirez. I'm sorry, my phone said. I couldn't understand your request. Fucking thing still didn't like my accent. Ramirez, I told it. There are only six numbers in my phone. Only one of them starts with R. Fucking call Ramirez, Siri. Processing. It said it was processing, but I think it just said that to be nice. I'm glad my phone is nice to me. I'm sorry, it said. I couldn't understand your request. Call R-A-M-I-R-E-Z. No processing delay. It rang, and she answered. What do you want, Vassal? I could never read her tone of voice. Maybe I'd caught her at a bad time. Maybe she was still mad at me about Mayday. Maybe she was tired. People who aren't me seem to just kind of pick up information like that when they talk to people. I don't even think they second-guess themselves. It seems like magic to me. I'm looking for work, I said. Of course you are, she replied. There's some irony to that. Work was the last thing I wanted. But I was walking east, away from the water and the dead bastions of industry. I was walking towards work. I'll meet you, she told me, and hung up. A random helicopter went overhead and my eyes grew wide and wild. There was a dumpster. I could throw my phone in there. Not secure enough. It was two blocks to the river. I could sprint, probably get the worst evidence into the water before I surrendered. But no searchlight lit me up from the dark heavens, and the sound of the rotors faded from the world before the adrenaline cleared my system. I picked up the pace. I got to the corner of Grand and Belmont, went under an awning. I took out my phone, called no one, and put it to my ear, started pacing. Fake phone call. You need a reason why you're just standing around on a street corner or you'll deal with cops. Cops and I didn't get along, and I had the warrants to prove it. Ramirez's car pulled up, black and glossy in the rain, picking up the dull blue of the streetlights. I climbed in the passenger door. No Ramirez. No driver at all. Typical. It probably wasn't a slight. It was just efficiency. I closed the door, and the car took off up Grand, heading north up past Rosa Parks, then wove into a neighborhood and stopped in front of a house I'd never seen before. Kids were playing on the block, chasing a glowy, laughing as the ball darted between them with a mind of its own. They laughed harder when one kid tackled the thing on the pavement and another three dog piled up. 
Most of the houses on the street were burned out, and not one of them had a light on in the window. Those kids weren't from the block, or else they were squatters. Either way, they seemed happy enough. The house in front of me was blacked out, I realized. The windows were too dark to just be unlit. It was three stories, painted the color of sand, and had an overgrown garden full of lavender and those creepy fucking passion flowers with their alien little stamen or whatever the fuck those antenna things are. The whole place was a paint-peeled reminder of the rise and fall of the Portland middle class. A camera over the door saw my scowling mug and decided to let me in. You got face rag on your fucking door, I called, when the door closed behind me. Good to see you too, I heard her say. The house was an empty shell, a dusty showroom. Ramirez was sitting lotus in the dining room, her yoga mat spread out on the hardwood floor. In the corner, discreet against the molding, was a matte black box no bigger than my fist. Hair-thin cabling ran out of its top and into the ground of a three-prong outlet nearby. If it worked right, that little wire kept the modem from overheating its core and spitting fire-hot bullshit all over the room. It didn't even have an indicator light. The best tech doesn't anymore. The best tech doesn't want you to even know it's there. Sit down, she said, indicating the room as a whole. She made eye contact, or maybe it's better to just say she looked in my direction. I couldn't see her eyes behind those Reed Pro FOV contacts and their bright blue glow, and she probably hadn't bothered to look past the screen that filled her vision. I sat. What kind of work, she asked. Anything, I said. Then I thought it over. Anything that's not on Lightnet or Darknet. Anything I can do direct. You're still not over it, she asked. I could have hit her. No, I told her instead. I'm still not over it. Maybe you should see somebody, she told me. If your anxiety is so bad it's keeping you offline, maybe you should do something about it. A million answers poured into my head unheeded. I took a few breaths, then picked the only one that hurt to say. I am. Even squatters needed therapy, and mine came from a woman named Helga. She'd worked as a cognitive therapist for three decades before she got laid off and her husband took her savings on a one-way trip to Florida. Motherfucker had his comeuppance, though, in one of those nightmare storms, and her cash and his corpse had washed out to sea. She moved into a squad a few months later, and we all did what we could to help one another out. Me, I fixed things. Helga, she fixed people. Well, Ramirez said, from her tech zen holier-than-thou fucking yoga mat on the floor of a stolen house. Let's get to work. She meant well. She was probably even my friend. But people don't open up in person anymore. Were we really friends if I never read her status updates? If our profiles weren't linked? I took out my laptop. It was encrypted to nine hells with layered volumes. But I think what kept it safe is that no one even used the fucking things anymore. No one under 30 remembered how they worked, and sure as hell no one of any age spent their time trying to figure out how to break into them. The damn thing still had a CD drive. I couldn't just move my eyes across the screen to shift its focus. I had to drag a little icon of an arrow around the screen, and I had to press buttons on the keyboard. It was tactile. It did non-tactile things, but I could still touch it. I could close it. I could look away from it. There's an exec in Rackman LTD who's been leaving a trail of meta that leads right offshore, Ramirez told me. Ramirez was a fixer, not a hacker. She kept track of information, things like who needed robbing and where they kept their shit but she couldn't get in the proverbial door. How much, I asked. She answered, not an insubstantial sum. It was a simple job. Break into Jonathan Albrecht's files and then his offshore bank account. Take out 2%. Any more than that, and then you might decide hiring a hit squad was worth the financial and legal liabilities. If we were lucky, we'd find some blackmail while we were there, wired up on a dead man's switch so if I stopped breathing, his wife would find out about his affair, or, if nothing else, the IRS would find out about his tax dodge, and I'd walk away with 5K for a night's work. Simple. Took me all night. Ramirez did yoga for a while, murmuring instructions to her contact lens computer while in downward dog and a thousand other poses. She said the names aloud, revolved triangle, pigeon, camel, and presumably got some kind of biofeedback telling her if she was doing them right. The rest of her jabbering was pure business, though. Checking up on clients and projects and whatever the hell it was she did besides find me yuppies to rob. I live in a world where some people feel it's more efficient if they multitask their relaxation with their work. Ramirez was a squatter because it was cool. She was a criminal because it was fun. Honestly, with her skills and drive and education and upbringing, but minus her criminal record, perhaps, she could have been the mark we were about to rob. 
She could have had his job and his life and his underlings and his investments. But as she told me once, stealing felt a lot more honest when it was illegal. I was still going hard at Albrecht's vapor drive when she checked in with me at 2 a.m. Simple jobs aren't always simple. Ramirez stretched out on the yoga mat and fell asleep. By 3 a.m. I'd gotten his biometrics from the pizza delivery system and was leveraging them against his drive's encryption. The privacy arms race is amusing. Lock things up with your biometrics, sure. It's a bad idea, but you'll do it anyway. Make it so your thumbprint opens your phone. But then one day, you want to get into your phone when it's in the other room and all you've got is your friend's computer, so you keep your thumbprint online somewhere. What do you lock that up with? Another 30-character passcode? Or maybe your retinal scan? Great. Now where do you keep that? For a hacker, it's a logic puzzle. Once you get one clue, you leverage it against the rest. By 4 a.m., I had everything I needed to convince his bank I was him. I set his account to make a series of payments to 30 different bank accounts, each transaction pre-approved. Random timed intervals between the transactions kept them from tripping the bank's security. Work isn't so bad. It was 4.30 a.m. when the battering ram slammed against the front door, a bass thud that dropped me into my body from where I'd been lost in the screen. Pigs, Ramirez shouted, going from sleeping to standing as fast as I'd managed to look up from my computer. We'd lose it all if Albrecht, which is to say I, didn't authorize the bizarre series of transactions at the end. I hate it the fucking worst when I want to fucking panic, but I can't. I wanted to cut and run, but if I cut, I lost it all, and if I ran, well, there wasn't really anywhere to go. Time left, Ramirez asked. Twelve minutes, thirty-four, I said. The ram hit the door again, and the frame cracked but didn't buckle. Ramirez must have done more for security than the face reg camera. Fuck, the camera. What's the face reg hooked up to, I asked. Kinda busy right now, she answered. She was typing away on the bare kitchen counter, pressing keys on an illusory keyboard only she could see. Is it fucking hooked up to LightNet, I asked. Yeah, it's fucking hooked up to LightNet. You think I got a face reg database in my pocket? The battering ram slammed again, and this time I heard cussing from the other side. They'd moved a breaching round soon, and me without my gas mask. You know I'm tagged, I shouted. 11.36 left. They're here for you, she answered, still typing away. They're from the bank, I said. Not the bank we're robbing, the bank that owns the house. I'm tagged for B&E. A shotgun racked outside and I lost it, triggered into memory. It was May Day, five years back, and we were all lined up, arm in arm. Undocumented migrants and squatters' rights activists. All of us riffraff who just refused to disappear or die. I felt more powerful, more powerful than I'd ever felt in my life. I felt more powerful in that company than I'd ever been while digging through the personal files of the most powerful men in the world, because that day I was part of something greater than myself. The police weren't having it, and they did their best to corral us. But there we were, in unvanquishable number, flooding the downtown streets of Portland, disrupting the easy flow of capital. At least that day, the invisible were visible. But the police attacked a few hundred of us at the base of the Burnside Bridge. I know what their plan had been, at least from up high, at least officially. I leaked it a few days later. They were supposed to leave us an exit, disperse us with gas and force as necessary. But they didn't leave us an exit. The news crews dutifully departed rather than face arrest, and the cops came in with bludgeons and pepper spray. They'd tried a few new toys out on us that day, dazzlers and sticky guns and a goddamn make-you-puke cannon. But at the end of it all, nothing beats the raw force of sticks and airborne poison. And we had our arms linked together, us brave people, and we were nonviolent back then, most of us. A lot can change in five years. People can learn a lot about the nature of power. Ramirez had been next to me, our elbows locked. On my other side, a woman I'd never met. Fifty years old, I'd say. We stared the police down. A cop came out from the police wall in front of us, took three steps towards me, looked me in the eyes, and raised the barrel of a shotgun, racking it. And I let go. I unlocked my arms and turned my face in fear. They took the old woman off in handcuffs, and they took me off in handcuffs, and I've forgotten that cop's face, but I'll never forget the barrel of his gun. And maybe I'm lucky Ramirez still works with me, still trusts me at all. I know I don't trust myself. The shotgun blast brought me back to the present day, but the door held. Ramirez had done her homework. Ten minutes, forty-three seconds left on the clock. I went into child pose. I'd never needed child pose as a child. Panic came over me in waves like fever, burning everything from my brain except the thought, I am not okay. I'm sorry about the camera, Ramirez said in the bizarre quiet. 
Whatever she'd been doing, she'd done it, and we didn't have much to do but wait and see what the fates had in store. It happens, I said. We waited out the clock in silence. I needed to quit, I decided, during short bouts of lucidity. No more hacking and no more breaking and entering. If I got out of there, I'd never be back. I'd just keep my head down. I wasn't okay. Better to just eat trash. Trash was free. Sure, there were too many squatters around southeast Portland, so I'd have to leave town. Go somewhere where I couldn't have a community. Maybe Marcellus would come with me. He said he loved me, and he might even mean it. And that might even be enough. I'd never be okay. Or the forest. The fires were worse every year, but I wasn't afraid of death, and I wasn't afraid of fire. I was afraid of police, and I was afraid of cages. Trapped in a barricaded house with bank cops outside, I kept myself as calm as I could by thinking about pleasant things, like burning alive in a forest fire. I wasn't okay. The clock ran out. The transactions were complete, and Albrecht signed off on them. Ramirez had it split up between the two of us in seconds. It did nothing to change my situation. The cops shot at the windows next, their rounds leaving cracks in the first layer of bulletproof plexi. More cursing. Ramirez was sweating. Literally sweating. I thought I'd experienced every symptom of fear, but I was wrong. I didn't sweat. That was a pleasant thought in the morris of my brain. Then I heard the air raid siren, a hand-cranked thing coming closer, and the cops outside started cussing in earnest. Darknet, I asked? It took me a long time to formulate words. Ramirez nodded. I put out the call as soon as I saw them. I uncurled my left arm from its place around my knees and set the door camera up on my screen. There were lights outside, squatters gathered at the closest street corner. The cops turned their backs to us, pistols and tasers drawn. There'd be too many of us out there for them to start shooting. That was the idea, at least. And every squatter on the street was wearing a camera broadcasting to Darknet. And for every camera, there was someone at home who would rather be asleep, hitting the big fat sensor button on a console or tablet or field of vision device every time something on screen might incriminate anyone but the police. Was it fair? Hardly. But the other side had been doing it for decades. Just knowing they were out there, the burning waves of fear lost the worst of their power over me. But they remained. I heard the crack of a grenade launcher and saw a muzzle flash, lasting so much longer on my screen thanks to the wonders of a low frames per second camera. The police were shooting tear gas, I'd guess. Ramirez was looking at me, saying something, but it was just white noise to me. All I could hear was the ruckus outside and the cold sound of my slow-beating heart. I really shouldn't have gone to work. I should have stayed in bed. I wasn't okay. We gotta go, Ramirez was shouting. She didn't need to shout. Words that promised a chance of escape cut through every frequency. She had her yoga mat rolled up under her arm, the modem in her hand, and her teeth gritted. Whatever she saw on the dark net, it must have been more promising than the haze I saw on my screen. I slammed the laptop shut. She threw open the door and dove into a cloud of pink smoke, cover provided by our side. I ran, choking my way into a maelstrom of shouts and smoke and pepper spray. The cop silhouettes were the ones bulky with gear and belts and guns. My friend's silhouettes were the thin ones and the fat ones unencumbered by armor or by much weaponry. They were the ones that kept on the move, playing mouse to the police's cat. The police were outnumbered but unafraid, backed by an empire's worth of legitimacy. They had jails and judges and health care and rich patrons and immunity. We had whatever we could make or steal or whatever minimum wage could buy. Ferocity was enough that night. A cop grabbed at Ramirez as she sprinted past. They always go for the smallest target, but backed off when a heavy-set woman stepped closer with a ski mask and a bat. No one got hurt. No one got arrested. Thirty squatters, most of them strangers, some of them kids, had turned out for the alarm and the cops beat a retreat once we were past their line. Invisible people take care of one another. If the bank would budget for it, the cops would be back during the day, combing the house for the clues they weren't going to find. Worst case, Ramirez was going to get tagged the same as me as a person of note, and she'd have to be more careful around cameras in hot neighborhoods. But more likely than anything else, the bank would drop it. We won, and they weren't going to want to draw attention to that. We won, but I didn't feel much like a winner. I was on edge the whole ride back to my neighborhood. Every time I saw another car on the street, I got a little spike of adrenaline. In the dark, every set of headlights was Schrodinger's cop car. Ramirez rode with me back to my neighborhood, and I had her drop me off a few blocks from home. I wouldn't let her self-driving car take me closer. I don't trust the things. 
One day, I'm going to get into some friend's car, and the car itself is just going to drive us both to jail. I know better than most people that machines will take orders from anyone with good enough code. Thanks for the work, I told her, when I got out in the soft twilight of morning. She laughed, not the condescending, haughty laughter I keep thinking she'll belt out, but a childish giggle that reminded me why I trusted her. We'd make so much money together, she said. I'll call you when I'm starving, I told her. And she drove off. It wasn't her fault. She lived like she'd never been hurt, like she'd never been broken, so I kept her at arm's length. Her strength reminded me of my weakness. There's something I tell myself, a kind of mantra I mutter on long nights when the far-off sirens keep me wired, or when I'm walking home through the fog and trying desperately not to jump at my own shadow as I pass from the light of one streetlight to another, and my own silhouette suddenly appears in front of me. And that mantra is, beauty lies on the far side of fear. Everything I've done in my life that I'm proud of has terrified me. I'd earned enough that night to keep a whole warehouse of people eating well for the next three months. And that wasn't nothing. It might just be worth it. Marcellus was lying on his back and snoring in earnest when I crept back into the room. He'd wrapped himself up in the comforter and I had to pry him free to get my naked body into the bed with him. But he murmured in joy when my hand found his chest and I held him tight and cried with relief and fear in equal parts. I was home. I had Marcellus. But my house was stolen and my partner was a felon so both were things the state could take away. How was it, he asked, half awake. It was work, I said. Fucking work, he mumbled. His eyes closed and he snored in that way he always did, endearing and soft. We hope you enjoyed this audio zine. For more, go to resonanceaudiodistro.org. Resonance is excited to be part of the Channel Zero Podcast Network, which includes The Soulcast, Witch Side Podcast, The X Worker, The Hotwire, The Final Straw Radio, Rust Belt Abolition Radio, Resonance, an anarchist audio distro, that's us, The Kite Line, Rebel Beat Radio, A Radio Berlin, Danthropology, Submedia, Trouble, Burning Cop Car, Radical Underground, Subversion 1312, Dissident Island Radio, It's Going Down, and more. For a 24-hour anarchist audio stream, go to channelzeronetwork.com and listen to a trailer for one of the other podcasts in the network now. Kite Line is a weekly 30-minute radio program focusing on issues in the prison system. You'll hear news along with stories from prisoners and former prisoners as well as their loved ones. You'll learn what prison is, how it functions, and how it impacts all of us. Behind the prison walls, a message is called a kite. Whispered words, a note passed hand to hand, a request submitted to the guards for medical care. Illicit or not, sending a kite means trusting that other people will bear it farther along until it reaches its destination. Here on Kite Line, we hope to share these words across the prison walls. You can hear us on the Channel Zero Network and find out more at kitelineradio.noblogs.org.